All right, uh, Chemistry 111 guys, we've got another exam coming up uh, this week, so we got to stay focused and uh, put those points in the bank so you can get the best grade that you can earn. And in order to help, I've come up with another set of uh, practice problems. This is about, uh, you know, three pages. By now you're, you're used to what's coming, so, um, you know, we've got to be able to do these problems. But not only do you have to be able to do them, you've got to be able to do them in a... In a pretty time effective manner and so uh, I'm gonna work through these hopefully it'll help you out maybe um, you know give you a few pointers I'll try to comment on maybe some things that can help save time on the exam and just things that I've noticed that people are doing uh, wrong or might uh, cause you to lose some points on the exam so let's go ahead and dive right in uh, this first question says okay we need to complete the following reactions and here we say okay well we've got this first reaction and it's HCl and uh, HCl is going to react with this calcium carbonate. Um, one thing that's really important is I want you to begin to start looking at these phases. They can be really important in kind of hinting as to what's going to break up and what's not going to break up when you start tackling these net ionic equations, which some of you I think are still having a little bit of a trouble uh, solving. And so let's, before we get down to that, let's go ahead and just get the products here. We've got this acid that's going to react with this carbonate and you're gonna get uh, essentially a displacement reaction, right? So the calcium is gonna uh, react there to form this calcium chloride. And again, you've gotta know formulas at this point, right? So if you don't know that calcium is typically a two plus and the chlorides are negatives, you're gonna have some problems here. And you can use your table of solubility, right? And you can see that uh, calcium chloride is indeed a soluble salt. So if it's soluble, we will write that as an aqueous, I think some of you are having a little bit of trouble in trying to figure out what's going to be soluble, what's going to be a solid, what's going to be uh, gas, all that kind of stuff, and, and use what we give you. We give you the table of solubilities on the periodic table as a, a nice little data cheat sheet, so make sure you're able to use that. The same one that we talked about in class. If we look at this then, we say, okay, well, what's left over? Um, well, we're probably going to form uh, some kind of uh, carbonic acid, right? And you might be tempted to write this guy here, which is um, this aqueous, again, it's a, an acid with carbonate. Um, but unfortunately, and this was in your reading, uh, this this acid is not very stable. Uh, you know, if you've had a, a Sprite or a, a lemon lime soda, you know very quickly that you get those bubbles, and so this will actually decompose. And instead of writing this carbonic acid, we probably more accurately would like to write that this is going to be water, which in this case is a pure liquid plus those little bubbles, which will be bubbles of carbon dioxide, which is indeed a gas. So if you didn't see that, it's okay. You're not gonna lose a ton of points, but you should remember that this is effectively a gas formation reaction, and it's very useful to, to recall that. Um, now we need to balance it, right? We've got two chlorides here, so we're definitely gonna need two of those HCLs, and we've got one calcium, one carbonate that got broken up, so we can stay with the one there. Very, very easy there. That's 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 pretty straightforward. Now, how do we know when to break things up? Well, what I do is I say, okay, look at this. This is a acid, right? You have an H in front of something there. That's hydrochloric acid. You look on your cheat sheet on the periodic table I gave you, and you'll see that HCl is one of the strong acids. You've got to remember the definition of a strong acid. That means it completely dissociates. So that means when this hits water, boom, it's going to break up, and you'll have no HCl left over. So we break that up to give you two um, H plus, and that's going to be aqueous plus, don't forget there are two of those uh, chlorides, right? So negative, and that's going to be aqueous. Now the calcium chloride, you might be tempted to break that up, but whoa, be careful, you've got a solid. Solids do not break up, right? I've told you that's a solid. It's not going to dissociate. So we would just carry that down. you got your calcium carbonate solid and that's all we have in terms of our complete molecular on the reactant side. If you go over here you see calcium chloride there's an aqueous here and the aqueous signifies that this is a soluble salt and so in that case it will dissociate and you're gonna get a calcium 2 plus right and that's aqueous and then you're gonna have two of those chlorides that break up from that material there. Now the next thing you have is water right and water is a pure molecular liquid Molecular liquids don't break up, so we're just going to write that unaffected as the liquid. And then finally, you've got the carbon dioxide gas, which is going to bubble away, and that's a molecular species as well. So we're just going to write that as 
carbon dioxide the gas. Now this is what we call the complete uh, ionic equation. We've got all the ions written, around, written out. And what we're going to do now is cancel the things, and this is really important, you only cancel what is exactly the same on both sides. And so I see H plus over here, that's not the same as water, so it can't be deleted. Uh, oh, we got two chlorides and two chlorides, so we can get rid of that. The two chlorides go away. Carb calcium carbonate, nope, that can't go away, so you're left over uh, with these guys here. And so what's left over is indeed your net ionic equation. We removed the spectators, right? The calcium, uh, I'm sorry, the chloride rather did not do anything here. It just was a spectator ion, and so we get rid of that. Really, really good example there of a lot of good chemistry and a lot of good uh, equation writing. Now this next one, we've got uh, sodium hydroxide with this uh, lead nitrate, and so it looks like we're going to have another uh, displacement reaction, in this case probably what a double displacement reaction, and so you're you're going to swap partners here and you're going to get, um, in this case it looks like you're going to get sodium uh, nitrate, and in this case, right, um, you can begin to kind of uh, look at the formulas here and you know that all nitrates, right, and all sodium compounds are soluble, so here you're going to say I know that's aqueous based on my solubility rules, if you forget the rules you've got the table, just look it up. And then finally, what's left? Well, you swap the uh, lead for the sodium, so now you're going to get the uh, lead for the sodium the other way, and you're going to get hydroxide and lead, so that gives you PB, and in this case it was lead 2, because you have two nitrates, right? And then that's going to give you OH2, and that, if you look at your solubility ta table, will show you that's a solid, that's going to be your precipitate, right? So there you go. Let's go ahead and balance. We got two nitrates on the reactant side, that means we need two nitrates over here. If you have two sodiums over here, you're going to need two sodiums over there. Two hydroxides, two hydroxides, one lead, one lead. We're balanced, that's good. So I'll go ahead and just put a little one there, even though it's not so important. All right, uh, now do we break things up? Well, sodium hydroxide, strong base. Strong bases, just like strong acids, completely dissociate. So we're going to get two. Uh, sodium pluses, right, and that's definitely going to be aqueous, plus the corresponding two hydroxides, that's also going to be aqueous. Now this lead nitrate is soluble because it's told, the reaction tells you it's aqueous, so we're going to get a lead two plus, right, because you had two nitrates there balancing it out, and we're going to have two of those nitrates, and that's definitely aqueous. And that's going to give us what? It's going to give us two, uh, the sodium nitrates, right? The sodium nitrate is soluble, so we're going to have two sodiums here. That's going to dissociate. Remember, all soluble salts dissociate, and you're going to have two. Don't forget to carry that coefficient over. Two of the nitrates, and that's aqueous as well. And then finally, you might be tempted to break that up, but don't forget, that's your precipitate. That's a solid. It will not break up, so we write that undissociated, right, just as the lead um, hydroxide. Boom. Now we look at what's the same on both sides. What's the spectator ions over here? And so, boom, we've got the sodium here. We get rid of that. We've got the sodium. Get rid of that. Hydroxide. Oh, no, the hydroxide is locked over here, so it's not the same. Can't get rid of it. Lead. Nope, can't get rid of that. Ooh, nitrate. We've got two nitrates all alone here um, on both sides, so those are identical. We can cancel those. And so you're left with the hydroxide, the lead, and the precipitate formation. Very, very simple. So make sure you, you're kind of checking your, yourself as you go along so you don't make any mistakes. This one we've got uh, zinc and HCl. This is going to be another single displacement reaction. And so here you're going to say, okay, well, I've got my zinc reacting with HCl. That's probably going to give us uh, some zinc chloride. And typically, a lot of the transition metals like zinc, you know, if you're not sure, maybe it's probably a you know, my guess would be about a two. That's pretty common for transition metals if you had to guess and you didn't know. Uh, so there you go, there's zinc chloride, and that's a, a soluble salt. So that's gonna be soluble. And then what's left? Well, you got some hydrogen gas probably. This is very similar to the one you did in lab. I think you use zinc uh, with HCl, but very, very similar. You got two chlorides over here, so we're gonna need two of those. You got two of those. Uh, hydrogen's over here, so we're good there, and we can just put a one in front of the zinc because we only need the one zinc. Now we break it down. Zinc is a solid. Be really careful so that does not break up. 
you have zinc uh, and, and for a zinc metal just by itself it's a zero so you don't worry about it that's just a little piece of zinc and then you're going to get uh, the HCl remember HCl is a strong acid so it's going to completely dissociate completely break up and we're going to write that as 2H plus and two chlorides we saw that up above in the previous example and now you look here you got the zinc chloride right the zinc chloride is aqueous so that's soluble so we break that up and you get zinc 2 plus and that's aqueous plus two chlorides and that's going to be aqueous and then finally you've got your H2 gas which we do not break up gases so it's written as is now we say okay here's where you gotta be careful zinc solid is not the same as zinc aqueous so you cannot cancel these you have two H pluses and H2 those are not the same so you cannot break the you cannot cancel those but we do have two chlorides here and two chlorides which are identical so we can cancel those out they didn't do anything so we're left with zinc solid react with acid to give you zinc 2 plus and H2 gas. Very good review problems. This is a really good problem to make sure you can do. All right, this next one is a very, uh, I'd say straightforward one dealing with ideas of uh, limiting reagent and percent yield, right? And so first thing we gotta do is we gotta be able to write an equation. So we got magnesium metal, and if you think about magnesium metal, right? That's gonna be just magnesium solid, neutral and you're going to react that with oxygen. Remember oxygen in the air is actually O2 as a gas. You react those together. Remember magnesium is typically a 2 plus oxidation state which goes well with the oxygen because oxygen's a 2 minus and then this is a solid. You did this in lab so you might recall that. You've got two oxygens over here so you've got to balance that with a 2 and then you need two magnesiums to balance it all out and there you go. Very very simple. Now it's telling you that you mix uh, some amount of magnesium with some amount of oxygen and you get a certain amount of the product determine the percent yield well there's a lot to unpack in this problem so all we need to do first right is find I would say find the the theoretical yield right and that theoretical yield is the most you can make because one will run out before the other and then once you find that then you can get the percent yield but if you try to jump to it straight away, you might get a little confused. So I like to break it down in two parts. First part, let's find the percent, the, the theoretical yield. So we're going to take the 0 0.5432 grams of magnesium metal. And remember, if I, if I have some reactant, I need to go to moles. And then I can take the mole ratio from the balanced chemical reaction of the magnesium oxide product and then just find the mass of that. So it's going to be, I tend to put it into one um, continuous problem. You can break it up if you want to. It does not matter to me. Here we have one mole of magnesium and if you copy it from the periodic table correctly, 24 point, what is this, 305 grams of magnesium and then for every, uh, what is that, you've got magnesium up here so it's going to be two right two uh, moles of magnesium and that's per two moles of magnesium oxide now this is really important you've got to you've got to label all of your numbers right with units and what they are because if you're doing ratios you've got to know what things are so you got to include those really important and then finally for every one mole of that magnesium oxide that is effectively 40.305 grams of magnesium oxide. And so on this one, you know, I probably included one more sig fig than I needed. And you can save time by not writing so many. If you notice here, you've got four sig figs, four sig figs. And so you don't need more than four. So I could have probably gotten away with rounding that, but it's not a big deal. But don't write too many extra sig figs because that can burn time on the exam. And if you calculate that, with your calculator, I think I get something like 0 0.908 grams. And please make sure you tell me uh, grams of what, right? That's the magnesium oxide. Okay, so that's one possible um, theoretical amount that you could get. But we need to figure out what we would get if we react all the oxygen. And so 0 0.6321 grams of O2. Again, make sure you recall that it's O2 we can go ahead and say okay for every one for one mole of O2 uh, 
uh, you get what 32 uh, right if I oh, goodness I'm making a mess over there sorry let me get rid, clear that out a little bit there we go come back and so we say what we've got 16 times 2 is 32.00 uh, grams right of O2 and then in this case you have one mole right one mole from the balance reaction for every two moles of the product the magnesium oxide and then you say I have one mole uh, of magnesium oxide per uh, 40.305 grams of magnesium oxide. These are really simple stoichiometric calculations if you crank them out. One thing to be careful about is double check your addition when you add these together from the periodic table because those can really mess you up if you're not careful. And then finally on this one I get 1.592 grams of magnesium oxide. And so obviously what will happen is once you form this amount, what happens? The magnesium runs out. So in this case, the magnesium is what we call the limiting reagent because it limits how much we can get. And this number then is also known as our theoretical yield, which is really important. So now we know that percent yield, right, is equal to the actual over the theoretical times 100%. And if you do that, you get from the problem 0 0.8796 grams of magnesium oxide over the maximum possible which is 9008 grams times 100 percent and if I crank that out on my calculator I think I get something like 97 point let's see do we still have four sig figs yes we do and so we'll say 64 point or sorry 97 point 64 percent yield that's pretty good this next question is not so important but it um, essentially just tries to ask you, um, in this case, um, you know, what would happen if you uh, somehow were to do a calculation where for some reason you might get um, more than 100% yield from your calculation. And that's, that's a weird thing, right? Because you know you could never uh, get more than your theoretical yield, but you know, what if something happened um, you know, in this lab in particular, I think you added some water uh, to, to react away all the magnesium nitride and, and the lab very uh, carefully told you to make sure to heat off all the water and remove the water. Well, if you didn't do that and you made a big error, you could have had more water left in your sample. So if you have impurities or things that, especially water, can add to the weight of your product, you can easily get over 100% um, in a calculation, but just realize that if you ever get 100%, it's due to the fact that you either made a calculation error or in the laboratory you made a experimental error by perhaps um, allowing your compound to take on impurities such as uh, water and, and really increase that weight more than it should be because it's not just product, right? If it's more than product, then of course it can be more than what you might expect. So um, that's something that happens in lab if you're not careful. All right, this next one I think gave some of you a, a little bit of difficulty because we haven't done the titration lab yet. Uh, when I gave you this packet, it was probably Monday, and you've yet to do, to do lab this week. But it's not hard. So for this one, I think it's, it's a really good stoichiometry question. And so we have this idea of KHP, and I'm just going to call KHP K, um, HA just to say it's an acid, and it is. KHP is a weak acid. We're going to react it with a strong base, sodium hydroxide, and we want to know um, what is the molarity of sodium hydroxide. So we can, I think I meant to give you the, the equation here, but we can just write one. We can say, okay, we have this acid HA, and it's going to be aqueous, right? And we're going to react it with some sodium hydroxide, and this is a monoprotic acid, I would tell you that, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio, and you're going to get um, some water, right? as in all neutralization reactions, plus some salt, um, sodium A, um, which would be probably aqueous, and there you go. So it's one to one, that's all you really care about here is the ratio of acid to base. Now everything else becomes very, very simple. We just go from grams of KHP, we have the, uh, the formula weight, so we go to moles, and then moles over liters is the molarity since it's one to one. But I'm going to go ahead and write this out so you can follow along at home. 
if you're confused I think it might help clarify a little bit of some of that um, but anyway we'll go ahead and just show you what it is uh, 0 0.8532 grams and I'm just going to call it KHP because that's what it is and I'll, I'll make sure I can give me some room to work here I know that it's 204.22 grams of KHP right for every one mole of KHP and you're going to be doing this in lab so it'll make a lot more sense one mole of KHP right for every one mole of sodium hydroxide and then finally you say okay well that gets me to what we canceled out grams of KHP we cancel out moles of KHP now we're at moles of sodium hydroxide you're trying to find the molarity so it's moles per liter so we can divide by the volume of solution which is given to us in milliliters and a quick division by 1000 gives you um, that volume in liters and I think I get something along the lines of 0 0.1187 molar sodium hydroxide and that gives you the right answer there there you go check our sig figs we're limited by four there you go this next one is kind of just going back to the the water quality reading it says okay we uh, you know we have lead in plus two and plus four oxidation states in your water which is a terrible thing just for sake of uh, speeding up this I'm just gonna take lead two, but you could do both of them it doesn't matter and let's write some reactions right we're gonna have lead two plus and it's told it's told you that it's dissolved right that means it's what that means it's aqueous which is unfortunate because it's very toxic and if you react it with phosphate right remember that phosphate is three minus and that is in solution you could you know maybe add some sodium phosphate to get that phosphate and you're gonna get um, a product right in this case it's gonna be lead um, and then you're gonna have phosphate and then in this case um, that lead phosphate is a three plus oh, okay we are sorry the phosphate's a three minus the lead's a two plus the least common multiple would be six so it's going to be lead three phosphate two and then now we just need to go back and balance there we go that's not so bad and we know that the lead phosphate due to solubility rules would be precipitate which means you could filter it right you could filter that precipitate and get rid of it from your water the other thing you can do, right, is, is increase the pH. And you, remember we talked about this. As you go an up in pH, right, that means you're going to go into basic territory. And bases are all about OH minus, right? And so that's pretty easy, right? You can sit there and say, okay, well, let's go ahead and take the lead 2 plus, and that's an aqueous solution. If we go up in pH, that means we can add some hydroxide, and that's also aqueous. We know that lead's a two plus, so we can write Pb2 um, plus, and then uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just erase it and jump to the chase, because we're getting kind of long here. Um, you know that it's lead two plus, so that means you need two uh, one minuses, so and then that's, a, that's a precipitate, and again, you can filter it, right? So we balance it out, there you go. Really, really simple, so you're forming a phosphate and a hydroxide precipitate which you can filter away to help remove some of this material from your drinking water which would be a very good thing to do. Alright this next one is dealing with equilibrium expressions and I think some of you are maybe having a little bit of trouble here and I would argue that the first thing you want to do here is look at the phases right you got an aqueous, an aqueous and a solid. Remember the solids don't change concentration um, you know, there are other reasons for that later on that we can talk about in other classes, but for right now, we'll just say that solids, they don't change concentration over time. So as long as there's enough to at least begin the reaction and get to equilibrium, we can write the equilibrium uh, expression as simply equal to uh, the concentration of lead 2 plus, because that is aqueous, right? Aqueous materials go into the equilibrium expression in the form of molar concentration for KCs and you've got chloride, and since the stoichiometric coefficient is two, you would write that. Um, now the lead chloride over here is a solid, so you do not include solids, so you're done. That's all you need for Kc. Uh, for this bottom one, they're all gases, so they will all be included. Now, for gases, you might typically call it uh, Kp, which is fine, I'm not too worried about that, but we still use the general form of products 
overreactants, and so there's a two there, so don't forget your stoichiometric coefficients, right? Really important. And then all of these are ones, so you can just put them in whatever order you please, because they are products, right? Uh, products in terms of multiplication products, excuse me, down here at the bottom in the denominator. And so there you go, you've got products over reactants, right? Um, so there you go, you've got the molar concentration in this case of this guy raised to the second all over the multiplication product of all three of these reactants and, and you're done. Alright, this next one, it says, okay, well, um, I've got some equation here and this, they're all gases so they're all going to be included and there's some K value and this K value is really small so it looks like it's going to probably favor reactants, right? And it gives you the equilibrium concentrations, that's really important. Um, and so okay we can say let's let's go ahead and just jump right in and, and write an equilibrium concentration expression um, and so sorry equilibrium constant expression and I'm gonna write my products right um, I'm just gonna write what is it sol sulfur dioxide and I'm gonna be more careful than I was up above and I'm gonna say I'm looking at my equilibrium concentration that's really important and there we go and those are both ones, so we don't have to worry about um, any stoichiometric coefficients that are n different than one. And then finally, the re only reactant we have is this one here that's the decomposition um, subject that's decomposing in these two, and I want the equilibrium concentration. Well, that's easy. I was actually given a number, which is really nice in this case, right? Uh, 0 0.078. And if I plug these all in correctly, again, just double check. Um, so here we say, okay, I've got the SO2, so I need to plug that in, 0 0.052, and that's molar. I do not know the chlorine uh, concentration at equilibrium, but I do know the concentration of this guy at the bottom, the reactant, right? And I can go ahead and just write that in, which means that I can set this equal to X, which is going to equal to the concentration of chlorine. And I can solve for that just with some simple algebraic manipulation. Right, I multiply by this, divide by that, and boom, I solve for X. So in this case, X equals concentration of chlorine, which if my calculator served me well is 0.162 uh, molar uh, Cl2. Not too bad. Okay, uh, this next one, I don't know why I'm getting so many page break problems here. I apologize. There we go. Move that out of the way. So this one says, okay, number seven says, consider the reaction. You've got this sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen, and you're getting this sulfur trioxide, which is uh, looks like a component of acid rain or something. And it's, oh, this is neat. It's We're also given the fact that... Um, this reaction has heat, right? Which means it would be actually an exothermic reaction because heat is a product. And now it says, looking at A through F, I do all these things, right? This deals with our friend uh, Le Chatelier, and we're looking at how we can disturb a reaction that's equilibrium by doing something and seeing which way it would shift, if any, to go back to equilibrium. So if we added oxygen, right? Oxygen's added, that is a reactant. And, um, for this one, I think it's worth noting that we need to be on the lookout. And something I typically do for this is I will go ahead and just write the equilibrium expression. You might say, well, Dr. Porter, why are you wasting time to do that when it's not asking us to calculate anything? Well, the reason I do that is very simple because I am curious about what's going to impact the equilibrium. Typically, only things in the equilibrium expression are going to impact the equilibrium. So if I have things in here that are solids, I don't want to write those, or pure liquids, I don't want to write those. So right off the bat, if I can eliminate those and keep them from confusing me, then I might be in better shape. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. It's totally up to you. But in this case, I'm going to add oxygen. Oxygen is a reactant. So if I add reactant, I'm going to shift it uh, to the products. And in a previous video, I talked all about equilibrium. So go back and look at that if you're confused. Um, here we've got sulfur trioxide. That's a product. If I add more product, I'm going to shift it back to uh, reactants. And, and to be honestly, it's probably to be honest, it's probably more accurate to be more careful and say I'm adding this. So once I disturb the re the equilibrium, 
it's going to shift back to uh, reactants to re reobtain a, a new equilibrium position. In this case, it's the opposite. I remove this, so that means the reaction is going to shift to, to the products. I increase the pressure by decreasing the volume, right? So if you increase pressure, you're going to go to the side that has the smallest number of moles of gas, which in this case is going to be products. And we can talk about why that is in, in the previous video. Catalyst is added. Uh, no uh, shift because of the fact that a catalyst only speeds up the reaction, but that just means you're going to get the equilibrium faster, but isn't going to be a, a, an issue with relating to um, the equilibrium constant. And then here you're going to say temperature is decreased. Well, that's kind of the same as saying you're going to remove some of that heat that's a product, which means it will shift to uh, compensate for that stress. Um, so there you go. And, and, you know, there's more to that heat idea, but for right now, this is an okay. Um, way to think about it until you learn more specifically about heat and temperature changes because temperature actually does change the K value but we won't talk about that right now. Alright next one page 3 here so um, this one's kind of a fun little problem I like it because it, it's not asking you to solve any numerical calculation but just to think about what the definition of K is and so for any acid, right, I can take HA as a generic acid, that's aqueous, right? And I'm going to look at this equilibrium of what? Now, one way you could write it would be just to write H plus and A minus. And that might be perfectly fine for right now. Um, you know, the other way you could write it would be more bronsted lari right? So you could have HA aqueous plus pure water as the liquid, right? And that would give you something like that, where you'd have what H3O plus, which would be aqueous plus what? It would be um, A minus, just like we had above. Both of those are fine for right now. Either way, you know, you can write a K, and a KA is kind of related to this guy down here. You say, okay, well, I can look at my products, right? These are all one to one, so I can take hydronium, concentration of that, um, again, these will all be at equilibrium, right? Now, uh, we're going to put a concentration of HA at equilibrium. And remember, water you do not put because it's a pure liquid, so don't, don't do that. Now, what is this telling us? Well, if you think about it, hydronium or uh, naked proton, um, H plus, is going to be a product, right? So wouldn't it stand to, to, to think about this in terms of the Ka. If you have a bigger Ka, right, big Ka's tend to favor products at equilibrium, right? Now granted these are all small, but 10 to the negative fifth versus 10 to the negative one, I would say that this Ka for trifluoroacetic is actually bigger, right? So I would say the bigger, the bigger K is gonna tell you that you're gonna favor products, right? And if you favor products at equilibrium, that means it's going to increase the concentration of H+, right? And if that's the case, that's going to be a stronger acid. So in this case, I would say that trifluoroacetic acid has the bigger K, so it's a stronger acid. That's really important. That's all you had to do. Very, very simple. Um, this one down here, um, you know, is, is pretty much just thinking about can you find buttons on your calculator and think about pH and pOH. The key thing here is I think you need to really recall the idea that pH plus pOH equals 14. So that can make a lot of this really easy. So if you know that this is 4.75, then this has to be 9.25. If you know this one's 11.89, this one has to be 2.11. Those are simple, all right? And here you can say on this one, I know how to calculate pH, right? pH is equal to the negative log uh, base 10 of the concentration of hydronium, right? Or H plus, if you want to write it that way, it's perfectly fine. And so here you get um, th this one I calculate, um, and I get something on the order of, let's see, I think I get, what, 2.19 for this one, which means if they equal 14, that gives me that guy there. Now, this one, we don't have the H plus, but we have the OH minus, so P of anything is negative log of that thing, and then you get 
hydroxide here and you can calculate a POH. And if you do that, I think I get 6.07, which if you subtract that from 14, you get 7.93. So that's a quick, quick little way to knock those out. Now these concentration uh, ones are a little bit tougher, right? Because if you're gonna do the opposite, if you wanna look at what is the concentration of H plus, right? That's simply equal to the opposite of log base 10, which would be raising something to the power um, of x, right? 10 to the x, right? So in this case, it would be um, 10 to the negative, uh, what is that? In this case, it's going to be for pH, negative 4.75. And if I crank that out, I think I get something on the order of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10, right? And then this one would be, if you do the same thing for the pOH, you get 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. Uh, oops, I made a quick translation, uh, transcription error on that. That has to be 10 to the negative 5. There we go. Um, just a little math mistake. So this one will give you this one, and this one will give you this one. And you do the same thing for all these other ones, right? So I think on this one I get 0 0.0078. Um, and these are all going to be in molarity, so it's important to either put your units in each box or put them at the top of the column. 1.3 times 10 to the negative um, 12. Um, this one's 1 1.8 times 10 to the negative 12. And then this one's 1 1.2 times 10 to the negative 8. This is all just button pushing. It's really, really simple. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but. Um, there are the answers I got. Hopefully yours are similar or I made a mistake, but hopefully I didn't make too, too big of a mistake there. All right, this last one, because we're getting kind of long here, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. You're given a monoprotic acid. Um, this just tells you it's one to one. Um, so here we can write that out, right? HA aqueous plus, what do we got? We got sodium hydroxide here, right? And that's aqueous. And that's going to react to form again, you know, simple neutralization reaction. Plus, um, what do we got? Sodium A, which is aqueous, right? And we want to know. Okay, the main thing is it's one to one. That's really critical. Now we we want to know what uh, the molar weight is, right? So the molar mass, and that's always uh, grams per mole. And so we've got the grams of sample which can go into the grams, and we just need to calculate moles. That's really easy because guess what? It's a titration. And at the end point, uh, equivalence point rather, uh, the moles acid equal moles base. So we've got the volume and the concentration so we can find moles of uh, base which will allow us to form moles of acid. And I'm gonna go ahead and write that out. And we can see here that we've got that's number of moles, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and write moles per liter of base, right? And then we know that we can multiply that by the volume in liters. And if we do that, the liters cancel, and we're left with moles of sodium hydroxide. And we can say that one mole of sodium hydroxide per one mole of our acid HA, right? So that gives us something on the order of 0 0.004094 moles of acid, right? And we can take that and plug it into there. And we go 0 0.5000 grams of that acid all over 0 0.004094 moles of acid that gives us something on the order of 1 point or sorry 122.1 grams per mole there we go um, so I know that was a little bit long but I think you know I worked it out very carefully here as best I could to give you some help I hope this uh, helps you as you clear up little areas of confusion we will have some extra uh, review time and, and Q&A and, and, and workshop type opportunities like we always have had for 
uh, review before we have that exam on Friday and I hope this will help so you can put some points away and be proud of your work and demonstrate that you know this stuff so make sure to work hard make sure you can solve these make sure you can solve them fairly quickly and be able to do really well in the exam um, I'll talk to you very soon see you later